who was assigned to Berlin and to work in the laboratory of Robert Koch during the 1890s. And it was Pfeiffer who, from his studies of cholera in guinea pigs, recognized there was something intrinsically toxic about most microbes, particularly gram-negative microbes, although in those days there was some uh, difficulty in distinguishing. He also assigned toxic properties to certain gram-positive species. He coined the term endotoxin to describe a heat-stable factor that he thought was tightly associated with cholera vibrio that would cause guinea pigs to develop fever and shock, and if sufficient quantities of microbes were given to die, even though he was working with heat-killed microbes, or with guinea pigs that had been immunized against cholera vibrio, so that all the microbes were actually killed in the peritoneal cavity by antibody and complement, and he could not culture them again, yet there was something toxic that caused a syndrome reminiscent of an authentic infection. Endotoxin became one of the central molecules in biomedicine during the early decades of the 20th century. And many laboratories worked on it because there was a certain conviction that gram-negative septic shock involved endotoxin, that it had uh, the effect of a virulence factor. Though ultimately it was seen that this molecule wasn't so much a virulence factor per se, microbes retained it for structural reasons. It was the major glycolipid of the outer leaflet of the outer membrane of all gram-negative organisms. And here is a typical lipopolysaccharide molecule where you have six acyl chains that are hooked to a disaccharide backbone with phosphates at either end. And then you have a highly variable uh, chain of sugars that trails off into the medium. Endotoxin, or lipopolysaccharide, became famous for many reasons. First of all, it did what Pfeiffer said it could do. It induced fever and shock during infection. It was known from the work of Coley and his colleagues to cause the necrosis of tumors that were grown in animals, transplantable tumors in mice, for example, and in human patients. It had an adjuvant effect that was first noticed in the 1950s when it was found that when mixed with ovalbumin and injected into an animal, it would greatly augment the antibody response. It had a radioprotective effect in that you could treat animals with low doses of LPS and expect them to survive higher doses of radiation, ionizing radiation. And it caused also nonspecific resistance to infection by other microbes. I had some brushes with LPS in my career quite early on. I worked in the laboratory of Abraham Browdy where LPS was something of a nuisance for us. It was something to get rid of and to be worried about because it could activate leukocytes and we didn't want that to occur experimentally. But I first began to seriously work on LPS in the 1980s when I joined the lab of Anthony Cerami at Rockefeller University. The focus of the lab at that time was on the phenomenon of wasting, or cachexia, in chronic disease. I think all of you know that many diseases, both infectious and neoplastic, will cause a situation in which animals become severely anorectic, human patients as well. There isn't so much a competition between a tumor and a, or an invading microbe and the host but rather something else seems to be going on because in this entire cow there might be only a few grams of African trypanosomes, which is what's causing the problem, yet the animal wastes away, becomes somewhat hypercatabolic, and also stops eating. The hypothesis was advanced that the immune system of the host must be detecting something made by the trypanosomes and producing a factor that would interact with the energy storage tissues of the host so as to deny access to triglyceride for uptake by fat cells, for example, and also to inhibit de novo synthesis of fat. There were a lot of variants of the hypothesis. It was imagined that perhaps tumors would make the same kind of factor, or other tissues might do so autonomously. It was believed also that Neoplastic cells could be detected by immune cells like the macrophage. It was felt that perhaps LPS would also induce the same factor. 
And things morphed in the lab in a certain way. Eventually, it was quite clear that the strongest inducer of cachectin, as we called it, and that was defined by the ability to suppress lipoprotein lipase activity in fat cells so that these cells could no longer take up triglyceride, was endotoxin, or LPS. And I devised an assay in which LPS was applied to cells of a mouse macrophage line, RAW264.7. These cells, after a few hours, would make cachectin, which then, when added to 3T3L1 preadipocytes, would have a pronounced shutoff of lipoprotein lipase activity. And that was the assay that I used to isolate mouse cachectin. This was something that I accomplished by a classical purification strategy, and I arrived at a highly purified protein with a subunit size of 17.5 kD, seemed to behave as a multimer, a trimer in solution, and uh, in fact I had to re-purify it by a different method entirely because this particular band was N-terminally blocked, but eventually I did get an N-terminal sequence of the molecule and after a short time, I found that it was highly homologous to human tumor necrosis factor, which at that point had only recently been cloned by workers at Genentech. It turned out, in fact, that this was the orthologue of TNF, and it had very high levels of TNF activity. And at that point, I knew something quite different than others did who had been working with TNF. I realized that this was a very toxic inflammatory molecule. The TNF story to that time had been the quest to isolate a non-toxic anti-neoplastic drug, basically. And yet here I knew that this was a molecule that could suppress uh, lipoprotein lipase in fat. And I knew that if I gave it to mice, it would cause them to become very sick, to look a lot like animals that had been treated with LPS. Furthermore, if I passively immunized mice against TNF and then challenged them with LPS, they were partially but very significantly protected, suggesting that this was one of the major mediators of LPS action. At this point, I began to think more and more about LPS itself and just how it was eliciting a response. We knew that it interacted with macrophages in some way, we knew that something happened, really very little was known at the time. Certainly no receptor had been identified for LPS. We knew that one consequence of LPS activation was the production of TNF, which was the major secretory product of the macrophage during the first two or three hours after LPS activation. And we knew that TNF had effects on many different tissues. It had two receptors that were practically ubiquitous and it would elicit inflammatory responses in a wide variety of cell types, orchestrating what happened after LPS was injected into a mouse. In the year 1990, as uh, Jules mentioned, Richard Yulevich, Wright being the first author of the paper, identified CD14 as at least a part of the LPS complex. This was a leucine-rich repeat molecule that was anchored to the surface of macrophages by a GPI tether, but it had no obvious means of activating the cell because it had no cytoplasmic domain. Many people postulated that there must be a co-receptor that would interact with the CD14 LPS complex to actually trigger the response, but no one had been able to isolate such a molecule and no one knew precisely what kind of signal it would evoke. From the late 1980s, NF-kappa B was known to be critical for TNF gene activation, which we took as the best uh, indicator of the LPS response at that time. And this was so because if one mutated two of the four NF-kappa B binding motifs in the TNF gene, that would completely abrogate the response to LPS. There was also a post-transcriptional step involved in TNF biosynthesis. In cells that were quiescent, that hadn't been stimulated with LPS, there was quite a substantial amount of the TNF mRNA, but it appeared to be locked in an untranslatable form, which was dependent on a UA-rich element in the 3 prime untranslated region of the molecule. 
Activating the cell would lead to release from the untranslatable form and then expression of TNF protein and eventually processing of TNF and its secretion. But everything seemed to revolve around this receptor. And as I considered the matter, no one at that point in the early 90s really understood how it was that we detect microbes for all the fact that more than 100 years had gone by since they were recognized as the agents of infection. We decided to focus on that problem very intensely and we decided eventually to take a genetic approach to finding the LPS receptor. In this respect, we were lucky that there were two strains of mice unrelated to each other called C3HHEJ, which is shown here, uh, and C57 black 10 SCCR, which had an allelic defect, but which isn't shown in this slide. And these strains were refractory to LPS, given at any concentration, and it was known that the same gene had been hit because one could cross the two strains, and the offspring would also be completely refractory to LPS, where heterozygotes retained some response. This was first observed in the case of the HEJ strain in the year 1965 by Hepner and Weiss. Later, it was found that these animals were hypersusceptible to infection by many different kinds of gram-negative bacteria. The best example was shown by O'Brien in 1980. O'Brien and colleagues found that the animals could be killed by only about two or three Salmonella type memorium organisms, where wild type control strains, C3HHEN, C3HOUJ, could survive doses of several thousand microbes and recover from them. So detecting LPS is the first step that a mouse must take to effectively combat the infection by native human mechanisms. The locus that was said to be affected was dubbed the LPS locus, and it was mapped by classical visible phenotypic markers by Watson and colleagues in the late 1970s to a broad region of mouse chromosome 4, but a huge region fact, which might contain hundreds of genes, and no one could go much further in those days because there weren't molecular markers for fine mapping and positional cloning was something in the future. We took up this challenge in 1993, and we mapped the LPS resistance phenotype on 2093 meioses in the mouse. We were only able to confine it still to a very broad interval of the chromosome, which we believed was 2.6 million base pairs. And beneath that, we could not map the locus further because there simply weren't any crossovers in the critical region. In fact, the critical region was still larger than this. It could not be spanned by fewer than 24 backs and one yak uh, in the contact that we built. And we looked with envy at other positional cloning projects in those days where people were able to map something to a critical region that contained one back or two backs or three. And here we had 24, and nobody had ever really been able to solve such an enormous interval. We were handicapped also by a lack of sequencing power. In those days, we began sequencing by hand to identify the gene content of this region, which was complete terra incognita, and eventually we had slab gel sequencers, but capillary sequencers were a thing of the future, and it was a real struggle to cover the area. Everything shown in yellow was sequenced more or less to completion. Everything in pink was sequenced, I would say, 90% to completion, and this was something that occupied us for a period of about three and a half years. We worked bidirectionally and by the year 1998, it covered about 90% of the critical region, and we were getting extremely nervous. The reason being that we'd found only a collection of pseudogenes. And in every case, we had a good story to tell about why this might be the LPS receptor or that might be the LPS receptor. But in the end, not only were they pseudogenes, but they had no difference in mutation comparing HEJ to HEN strain and we had to discard them one after another. It was in September of 1998 that we found what we believed to be the authentic gene. Of course, we could have said the same about all the others. But this gene was attractive for certain reasons that Jules has touched upon. 
The gene in question was the total like receptor for a gene. There were by that time known to be five total like receptors in mammals. These were genes that coded for proteins similar to toll, but none of them had a known ligand, and none of them was known really to be involved in infection. The case could equally be made that these were defensive proteins or they were developmental proteins based on the work in Drosophila. The story seemed appealing to us, however, because of what Jules mentioned already, and what I've reiterated to you. It was known that LPS could bind to CD14, a leucine-rich repeat protein. It was known that toll-like receptor 4 had a similar ectodomain structure, and yet had a cytoplasmic domain reminiscent of that in the IL-1 receptor, so it had at least the potential to deliver an inflammatory signal that could activate NF-kappa-B. It made sense to hypothesize that perhaps LPS would first engage CD14 and then some kind of complex would form allowing for the transfer of LPS to the authentic receptor, which then would signal. Then too, we had the story of the fly. To use as an analogy, here mutations in toll would lead to a state of immunocompromise in which the fly could be overwhelmed by fungal infection. In the HEJ mouse, mutation of toll-like receptor 4, which did prove to have a mutation distinguishing it from the HEN substrate, would lead to a state in which uh, there was inability to combat gram-negative bacterial infection. When we found a mutation in TLR4 that was unique to the HEJ substrain, we were very excited and thought almost surely this is the same, this is the mutation that we've been after. However, it might have been argued at that point that uh, we were simply looking at a chance difference between the strains that had crept in over the last 35 years. And so we had to look at the C57 black 10 SCCR strain. There we found in that substrain of black 10, but not in any other, that the gene was deleted entirely. And so both alleles were associated with mutations of that locus, and we were entirely sure that this was the gene we were after. But the question remained, is this really a receptor for LPS? Jules has told the story that in the fly, it's not the receptor for any product of microbes. The receptors are upstream, and they lead to the generation of a ligand Spetzla, which then can activate the receptor. And we decided to use a special trick known in the LPS field to look at the question. It's known that lipid A is the toxic center of LPS. This is a hexaacylated molecule that is reactive both in mouse and human cells. It will activate either of them to make cytokines. On the other hand, a derivative of uh, well, I should say a precursor of lipid A, known as lipid 4A, which has only four acyl chains, is agonistic for mouse cells, but not for human cells. There it acts as an antagonist. We made use of a permanent line of C3H HEJ macrophages that Paolo Ricciardi Castagnoli made in collaboration with us. These cells should be responsive to LPS, but they have no active TLR4, so they can't be. We transfected them to express either mouse TLR4 or human TLR4. And we then treated the cells with either lipid A or lipid 4A. And we asked, is it the TLR4, uh, the species origin of the TLR4, that determines whether there will be discrimination between the tetraacyl and the hexaacyl form of ligand? And I'm just showing you the results schematically. In the case that we used an active mouse TLR4, it would respond to both ligands. If we used an active human TLR4, it would respond to only one ligand. Now, the only molecule that differs in the system is the TLR4, whether it's of human or mouse origin, that's the difference. And it seemed quite clear that if you had a human molecule in place, it could discriminate between the two ligands. The mouse receptor could not, recapitulating what is found in the natural cell types of these species. So it was the TLR4 that was making a decision as to whether there were two extra acyl chains or not. And on that basis, we concluded it must be in very close proximity to the ligand. 
In effect, it was the receptor. We had to wait for the work of Gio Li, which came along quite a long time after that, to have crystallographic support for this model. And Gio Li showed that, in fact, LPS would associate with another subunit, shown in magenta here, known now as MD2. And most of the acyl chains would fit within this basket provided by MD2, which is itself tightly bound to TLR4. However, there was some contact between LPS and the leucine rich repeat backbone of TLR4 itself. In fact, the species origin of both MD2 and TLR4 turned out to be critically important for getting a response. And this is where the recognition of LPS begins, and this is what sets in motion all of the complex events that occur during septic shock. This was exciting for many reasons. First of all, there were, at that time, five, and soon there were 10 uh, human toll-like receptors known, 12 in the mouse. It made sense to hypothesize that each of them could detect different ligands of microbial origin, and that turned out to be true. It was mostly the work of Shizuo Akira who identified exactly which TLR engages which ligand. There was also the evolutionary story. We have here a tree of the tier domains across the tree of life, as it could be shown in those days. There was a Drosophila toll cluster. There were IL-1, IL-18-like molecules and adapter proteins that had tier domains. There were the mammalian toll-like receptors. And we noted at that time, too, that there were plant disease resistance genes that had tear domains, the signaling domain that we found in toll-like receptors. It was known that the plant disease resistance domains had specific associations with disease resistance. And this was one example at the time. There was a certain tear domain containing protein that would convey resistance in flax to the fungal rust melanxoralini. We knew from other work that I haven't time to discuss that in humans, there's an overabundance of mutations of TLR4 in patients with meningococcal sepsis, suggesting that about 7 to 8% of disease attribution in our species can be tracked to mutations in TLR4. And Jules has already told you the story of fungal infection in the fly. So clearly, this was one of the major disease resistance mechanisms operating in innate immunity in mammals. There is much more to tell of the whole story, but I'm not going to go further with the tolls. I'll tell you briefly that we used forward genetics from that time forward to look to see if we could find other proteins involved in TLR signaling and did find new co-receptors, new adapters, new chaperone proteins that are needed to guide toll-like receptors to the correct intracellular compartment in order for them to signal. But I want to speak more about making phenotypes at large in the mouse. We wanted to see if we could create new immune deficiency phenotypes and find other mechanisms of immunity, also mechanisms of inflammation. Because the flip side of immunity, the legacy of having an immune system, is that we can develop inflammatory diseases if things aren't controlled quite right. We look forward to the, sol to the solution of the mouse genome, the publication of the mouse genome, which occurred in 2002. And at that time, we knew that positional cloning would be much accelerated. It would be possible to track down mutations really much faster than before. And we began to treat mice with an alkylating agent, ethyl nitrosourea, to induce mutations at random throughout the genome. And after inbreeding them through two generations, we began screening G3 mice for new immune phenotypes. We saw many bizarre-looking mice over these last 10 years in our colony. And these are all, again, new mutants of various kinds. You can imagine that there are also disturbances in the immune system. And those are what we're really after. Once a phenotype was detected, formerly it took many years to find it. And People would try to map to beneath one megabase. Then you would build a contig, as we did across the critical region. Increasingly sophisticated methods were used to identify genes. And we struggled with that. 
But after the mouse genome was sequenced, it was never necessary to make it concrete again. Instead, you would map sometimes rather loosely to a critical region. You would go to your favorite genome browser, you would get a list of candidate genes, and then you would sequence them, exon by exon usually, until you found the causative mutation. Tracking down a point mutation remains somewhat difficult because if you map to low resolution, you might have 50 or even 100 gene candidates in an area and a skilled operator might deal with only one or two genes per week. Therefore, we wrote software in our lab to automate this process. And this worked by, first of all, defining the critical region. When there were fewer than 1,000 coding exons, a computer would design primers to amplify all of the coding region across the critical area. These would be sent to us in 96-well format, and we would put them onto the deck of an FX robot, which would then amplify everything, clean up all of the products with magnetic beads, measure the products and dilute them correctly, and then mix the correct sequencing primer with every template, and then we would get another stack of plates we would put it onto an ABI capillary sequencer, we would get trace files. And a human would no longer have to interpret the data. The computer would look for a discrepancy between wild type and mutant strains and would declare the mutation, or it would say how much coverage there was, and it would, again, uh, in a second iteration, make new primers to cover what was missed. This let us find mutations quite quickly, and we were able to find as many as 50 per year this way, which was about a 250-fold increase in speed over before. But things have improved even more, and that whole system is obsolete now. These days, if we have a G3 mouse with a phenotype, we sequence its genome, we find all the candidates, and with loose mapping, usually only one of them is under consideration. Genome sequencing prices will soon drop to about $1,000, and turnaround time will be about one day. And finding the mutation responsible for phenotype is therefore no longer the bottleneck. It's generating phenotype, and then understanding phenotype that's most important. We've kept under surveillance several phenomena of immune importance in our lab. We look at the humoral response to immunization. We look at TLR, NLR, and RLR signaling. We look at a life and genes that make a life and death difference to infection by a normally harmless virus, MCMV. And we look at intestinal homeostasis, the, the fact that we can maintain trillions of microbes in our intestinal tract without developing serious invasive infection. And I'll tell you about that last process in the last part of my talk, because that's something where we found many mutations and we've been able to put together a credible story of how uh, this process operates. This is relevant to all of us because in humans, as I think you all know, there is such a thing as inflammatory bowel disease. And this is a classical inflammatory disease in humans. Depending upon the definition, one can say that 0.1 to 1% of the population in Europe and North America is affected by IBD. And we know of two major types. We know of Crohn's disease, also uh, called regional ileitis sometimes. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Crohn's disease. Yes, also called regional ileitis or uh, sometimes granulomatous colitis and it's restricted in distribution to the distal small bowel and to all of the large bowel in most cases, so it can affect any part of the intestinal tract. And we have ulcerative colitis, which is a colon-only phenomenon. And these are mainly distinguished radiologically. You don't go to a pathologist to make the diagnosis. It has to do more with the appearance on uh, contrast studies or uh, on the distribution of lesions. We know that there's a genetic etiology because these are familial diseases to a large extent and there's concordance in twin studies. But we know that microbes are also crucial because every animal model of the disease that's been created is abrogated by a germ-free environment that will suppress the phenotype. When I was in medical school, people referred to this, and they still often do today, as a complex genetic disease. 
which if we define it carefully, we can say this means a disease in which allelic variation at several loci is needed to produce the phenotype. But it's not actually known whether in the usual case it is a complex disease or whether we're dealing with a large collection of simple genetic diseases in which there's really only one thing wrong. I would say it's equally possible that the latter applies and that most human beings may be just one mutation away from having IBD. There may be hundreds of gene targets in which these mutations can occur and there could be both dominant and recessive forms of the disease. And in this scenario, genome-wide association studies would never pinpoint most of the, of the genes involved. Even whole genome sequencing would be difficult to use to find the cause unless many thousands of genomes were sequenced in large case control studies. But we might identify many of the candidate genes through mutagenesis in the mouse. And we could even offer the hypothesis that if the one mutation away scenario is correct, it should be very difficult to, is incorrect, it should be very difficult to make an IBD-like disease in mice using a point mutagen. And this is, of course, something that we can test. And so Katerina Brandl, in my lab, set up a screen which was really very simple. She uses a provocative agent called dextran sodium sulfate. These are polymeric molecules that are cytotoxic to cells of the epithelium. And they can be put into the drinking water and given to mice at a very low concentration that won't cause colitis in normal mice, but it does cause colitis in exceptional mutants. And that is scored simply and objectively by measuring weight loss. So this is an environmentally sensitized screen that we're using. It tends to examine the innate immune phase of colitis because it's carried out only a period of, over a period of seven days. We assume implicit in, in making the screen is the assumption that similar injury or injury of a similar magnitude occurs from time to time in all of us whenever we have a toxigenic E. coli infection, for example. But there may be humans in which resolution occurs and others in which the problem goes on for a very long time and creates serious sustained disease. It was also anticipated that a fraction of the mice scoring as abnormal with the DSS screen would develop spontaneous disease given enough time. This screen was applied to 5,846 G3 mice. And I think all of them are shown here so it's impossible to count all of the dots. You'll have to take my word for it. And I want you to look first at the controls. You notice that if we give no DSS, just keep mice on normal water, those are the gray dots, the animals will gradually gain weight over the period of the screen. If we give 1% DSS to black six mice, and we accumulated this over a long time, always doing a few controls with the G3s, Again, the mice will gain weight, and there's no significant difference. The blue dots are the G3 mice, and you can see that most of them also gain weight, but here we have outliers, and these are the mice that we're interested in. Most of those turn out to have transmissible genetic diseases that make them susceptible to DSS. And here are the mutants that we've accumulated over time. Some of them have Japanese names, some of them have names that are derived from Bach cantatas because Kati Brundle and I are both Bach cantata fans. And uh, on the other hand, it was Wataru Tomisato who took over the screen after Kati. He gave Japanese names for fish to most of his mice. Just to show you what such a mutant looks like, I'll show you one example of, called Phoebus. If you look at wild type mice, you see they have really a normal colon architecture. These lucent cells are goblet cells. These are villi, and they're nice crypts, and they're neatly aligned. Everything is normal. In the Phoebus mouse, you see that the epithelial cells are invaded by these inflammatory cells. You see there's swelling of the submucosa and also of the outer muscular layer of the bowel. This is severe disease. These animals will die within about four days on DSS. And uh, if you looked at this, you would say this looks like an 
In all, 33 putative mutations were found by unbiased screening. 18 of those were confirmed as transmissible. Six were tracked down so far, and they fall into five genes. In addition, we took every mutation that scored in visible or immunologic phenotypes from the lab, and we know of 18 other mutations in 17 genes that will score in this screen. So in all, we have 22 affected genes that can give a colitis phenotype with DSS, and on that basis, we can begin to put together a fairly cohesive picture of what has to go right to prevent colitis when a mouse is exposed to DSS. These genes can be roughly classified into categories as shown here. We know of effector cytokine defects, sensing defects, secretory effector defects, problems either with excessive ER stress or unresolved ER stress, problems with proliferation of the epithelium to allow closure of the wound, and then there are some that we don't really understand. One of the first things that we do in order to understand what's going on with a mutation is to do reciprocal bone marrow transplantation. And in this way, we can say whether the mutation affects the hematopoietic, and presumably the immune component, or whether it affects the epithelial component. There are some mutations, like a mutation in UNC13D, which is involved in degranulation strictly of hematopoietic cells, where bone marrow transplantation assigns responsibility to the hematopoietic compartment. And there are other cases, for example, mutations affecting toll-like receptors, which is scoring the screen, where knocking out all TLR function with compound homozygous mutations at the TCAM1 and MID88 loci uh, leads to a problem, but here the problem is strictly in the non-hematopoietic compartment. And we've shown that over and over again, although something to the contrary was published elsewhere. I'll just show you quite quickly that if you transplant wild-type marrow into a MID88 TRIF double deficient mouse, you have horrible disease, even though the hematopoietic system is normal. If you transplant double deficient marrow into a wild-type mouse, everything looks pretty normal. So what does happen under normal circumstances when we do this assay? We imagine DSS punches holes in the epithelial monolayer. Microbes escape from the lumen of the bowel into the lamina propria. And then a couple of things have to happen in order to restore homeostasis. The wound has to close, first of all. And second, the infection has to be dealt with effectively. And that happens as a result of innate immune cells like neutrophils, perhaps NK cells, certainly macrophages. All of these are important in ways that I think all of you can imagine. As to the closure of the wound, there we have some insight from a lot of our mutants as to what must be happening. Our mutations, Pococurante, Torpid, LPS2, 3D, Languid, LPS3 and 4, RSQ1, CBG1 and 3, implicate TLRs 2, 4, 7, and 9, also UNC93B, which is necessary for the transport of these latter two TLRs, and three of the adapter proteins in signaling. Also, a mutation in IRAC4 scored in the screen. So obviously, the toll-like receptor apparatus, the receptors themselves and the signaling proteins downstream, are critical for mice to recover. And there's not uh, a great deal of redundancy between different TLRs, surprising as that might seem. An isolated TLR9 mutation will do it. An isolated TLR7 mutation will give colitis. We believe that the response triggered by TLRs on epithelial cells is quite different than what happens in the macrophage. It induces growth and it induces secretion of mucin and antimicrobial peptides. As to the nature of the growth signal, certain other mutations gave us added insight. The TLR signals uh, probably work through growth factors that we first were alerted to by two mutations called WaveDex and Velvet. These were visible phenovariants found in the colony because of their wavy fur and their eyes open at birth phenotype. They look essentially the same as one another, but the velvet mutation is a dominant mutation in the EGF receptor. The wave dex mutation is a recessive mutation in TACE or Adam 17. 
which cleaves and processes many cytokines, including TNF, and also the epidermal growth factor uh, family ligands. This simply shows you that the velvet mutation works in the epithelial uh, compartment. This shows you that, this shows you that the, the Adam-17 mutation works in the epithelial compartment based on reciprocal bone marrow transplantation. And the same is true of velvet. And the question was, presumably velvet is processing some uh, proteins that engage the EGF receptor, but which family members are of key importance? We looked by microarray analysis at mice that were deficient in MIT-88 and TRIF, and so don't uh, signal at all via toll-like receptors. And we found very significant uh, downregulation of amphiregulin and epiregulin, which are two of the EGF receptor ligands, of which a total of seven exist in all. We also found that if we depleted microbial flora with antibiotics, that would lead to downregulation of amphiregulin and epiregulin, and in this case, to EGF itself. So perhaps three ligands might be involved. We injected mice with LPS systemically by way of tail vein and found that amphiregulin and epiregulin, but not EGF, were strongly induced by LPS challenge. And then most persuasively of all, if we gave mice daily doses of amphiregulin by an IV route, that would partially, though not completely, protect them from the colitis phenotype. Putting these facts together, we can imagine a simple linear pathway whereby microbes that reach the uh, lamina propria will activate the toll-like receptors on epithelial cells. That will induce NF-kappa B, which is a prerequisite for the expression of pre-epiregulin and amphiregulin. These have to be processed by Adam-17, and it's mainly these two cytokines, probably, that bind to the EGF receptor and in an autocrine or paracrine fashion trigger uh, the growth of the epithelial monolayer. Remember the Phoebus mutation that I showed you earlier. That turned out to be a mutation in aquaporin-3. Water regain by the epithelium is critical for the expansion of epithelial cells and for closure of the wound. I mentioned ER stress as one category of mutation that's important. The clue here was a phenotype called wood rat, which we found as a coat color mutation and tracked to the transcription factor processing enzyme MBTPS1, also known as the site one protease. Among its duties, this enzyme processes ATF6 from its inactive latent form to an active transcription factor that then induces one arm of the ER stress pathway and so can resolve ER stress. Two mutations were found in MUC2. These were Schlendrian and Muscatenbein. These create ER stress in goblet cells, which make such an abundance of the protein. And uh, MUC2 uh, is still secreted in heterozygotes, as these are both dominant mutations, but they contribute added ER stress to the point that the goblet cells die, and then you have an epithelium full of holes rather than a healed epithelium. Now I'll tell you just last about one very interesting new mutation that we picked up in our screen. It's shown here by the yellow dot and this phenotype was called the klein schocher phenotype. It was a very severe striking colitis leading to death usually within seven days or so after DSS was administered. And it too causes a wipeout of the epithelium as you see. This is one of the epithelial category mutations. It doesn't affect hematopoietic cells. And while very little was apparent when we looked with H&E stain, at the epithelium of the colon or small intestine, if we stained with periodic acid shift looking for glycoproteins within the cells of those parts of the intestine, we could see differences. First of all, we saw that there were very few pennant cells, and we saw that the goblet cells were abnormally shaped and that there seemed to be also fewer of those, and each one had less mucin within it. We then looked by electron microscopy, and I'll just direct your attention to the bottom here. 
These are penic cells, which make antimicrobial peptides in the small intestine. And they normally have these large electron-dense granules. In the case of Tanshoker, they have really very small granules. And similarly, the mucin granules that you see in goblet cells are smaller, and they have a variable electron density. They look obviously different than in the wild type. We can see that even at a higher magnification, so you can see there's no doubt that these are very fragmented. It's as though they don't coalesce or they don't mature properly in the mutant. And you can tell that many of them are being invested by uh, endoplasmic reticulum, and they seem to be winding up in autophagosomes, these microgranules. We found at the mRNA level and also at the protein level that antimicrobial peptides were made in smaller amounts in klein Schoher mice. We were also challenged to show that this doesn't apply only to DSS, and so we infected the mice with Citrobacter rodentium, which is taken as a model of toxigenic E. coli infection in humans. And we found that the klein Schoher mice lost more weight and became generally much sicker than the wild type, this particular dose of, of Citrobacter rodentium. There was also a poor barrier function in klein Schoher. If the mice were given fluorescein, for example, it would leak into the blood much more than in wild-type mouse, suggesting the integrity of the monolayer was not normal. And we found, furthermore, after a period of time, after about a year or a bit more, that there seemed to be spontaneous inflammatory disease in klein Schoher mice and this you could see partly because the colon was shortened, which is one measure of inflammation. Furthermore, histologically, we could find evidence that the villi were becoming a kind of a webwork with anastomoses, as you see here. And there was also invasion of the submucosa and lamina propria with uh, mononuclear cells. And in some cases, we could see macrophages that were polynucleate. And uh, this suggests that they're beginning to form granulomas. So, what do we know about the protein? It uh, turned out to be a new protein about which really nothing is known in mammals. It has multiple membrane-spanning domains. It gives this phenotype that I've shown you, but it also affects pancreatic acinar cells in a rather different way, not causing any kind of disease, but no other cell types as far as we know. And it seems to be something required for the coalescence or maturation of vesicles. Now, I want to emphasize, this really is Crohn's disease in the mouse as far as I'm concerned. We could debate whether it really is the same or not. But if this mouse walked into a doctor's office, given that distribution of lesions and the general appearance of the lesions, you would have to say this is a spontaneous disease that looks more than anything else like Crohn's disease, which after all is a rather protean disease even in humans. So uh, you may argue with that, and I'll argue back with you. <laughs> Where would we place this on the map? We would put it probably here. This is something needed for granule maturation, and it fits into the scheme of events that I've shown you. But it is obvious then that there are many cases in which a mouse is one mutation away from having an IBD-like phenotype. The last question to consider is how far have we gone here? We looked at 5,800 mice. How much saturation does this represent? In the old days, we had a rule of thumb that 10,000 G3 mice meant that we'd hit 18% of genes. But uh, really, we could never be very sure of that. And certainly, it's not a linear thing, saturating the mouse genome. We've always wanted to know for X number of G3 mice that we've looked at, just how much damage have we done, and how can we be sure of it? In our colony management system, we have variable pedigrees, but all of them are trackable, and every G3 mouse, we know its ancestry perfectly well. We also know from direct measurements of uh, mutation in G1 mice that every sperm that makes a G1 mouse <coughs> has about 61 coding changes. And the exact number per sperm varies in conformity with the Poisson distribution, which is what you would expect for a random 
process like this one. We know this based on sequencing incidental mutations, and we know the type of mutations that are induced by ENU as well. We know that they're somewhat strand-specific, which we don't understand, but we can see that they certainly are not uniform. It's very rare to make C to G. It's very rare. It's very common to make A to T or T to A changes in the coding strand. Using this information, we can simulate mutagenesis in a mouse. And we do this using a large Linux cluster computer. We introduce mutations in the exact frequency that they're observed experimentally using the number of mutations calculated at random from a Poisson curve. And we then can simulate transmission of the mutation together with linkage between adjacent mutations into the G2 and finally G3 mice. And then we can delete mice that have obvious null alleles in genes that are known to be lethal when knocked out. And finally, we keep a record of all the mutations that accumulate in G3 mice. And uh, we ask, how many overt null mutations are there? I'll tell you, first of all, we know that phenotype doesn't usually come from null alleles, but from missense mutations. And we take that into account as well in calculating how much uh, genetic damage we have done in a given number of mice. And I'll cut to the chase and tell you, in 5,846 G3 mice, we think that we've destroyed 14 to 15 percent of all genes in the genome, or at least mutated them to a state compatible with their detection by phenotypic screening. Since we've observed 18 transmissible phenotypes, we could guess that there are somewhere between 120 and 130 target genes for DSS colitis sensitivity. That means about one in every 200 genes in the genome is a target. And that would mean, of course, that there would be many, many times of causative mutations in humans. Dr. Hoffman is getting impatient. <laughs> but this is my last slide. I would, would just propose uh, that the way forward in human genetics might still be to look first at the mouse, as we're doing, to assemble a list of candidate genes. Then in the human, uh, one might uh, regard those candidates seriously when one finds the corresponding phenotype. And they could certainly be validated again, rather than anything else. So this is uh, the last known picture of my lab group uh, in La Jolla. I've now moved to Dallas. And a few of the people have come along with me and we're reconstituting there. I want to say that uh, Kati Brandl and Wataru Tomi Sato did the work that I showed you before. It was Yu Sha who developed the algorithms for measuring saturation of the mouse genome. And uh, I want to thank also Alexander Polterak for the earlier work done on the positional cloning of the LPS locus. So if there is still time, I'll answer questions. Well, Bruce, thanks. Unless, uh, is there one question, that then we're going to move ahead. So fire away. Congratulations. A short question. In diabetes, we've shown elevated levels of TLR2 and 4, both in human diabetes and in mice. And the question I'm hearing to you is about endogenous ligand or other activators of TLR4 and 2. Because why doesn't the receptor desensitize with time? Why does it continue to be activated if you look at downstream signaling, trip trap, or if you look at money? Uh, there's a, a real question whether there might be endogenous ligands for toll-like receptors. And for some of them, I think the answer is quite clear. For TLRs 9 and, and 7, we do believe that some inflammatory diseases are caused by uh, endogenous nucleic acids and perpetuated as a result uh, of expansion of lymphoid clones, for example, uh, are able to take in and become activated by nucleic acids. It may be that similar sorts of things go on with other tissues, and many people consider type 2 diabetes now as a kind of inflammatory disease in a sense. 
that uses the same pathways. Uh, the question you asked is why, and I don't really know the answer why it seems that, that these are involved, but I believe they may very well be. <laughs>